So good afternoon everybody and welcome to our third and our final session of um, relationships between working memory and long-term memory and learning and it's a, a real pleasure to welcome Dr Rebecca Gordon from UCL Institute of Education uh, back joining with us again today so um, if we can move on to the protocols I don't want to, to take up too much time I want to give Rebecca and yourselves as much opportunity as possible but we'll just very quickly run through the protocols calls. So please do mute your microphone if you're not speaking just to minimise any background noise or, or feedback. And today's session is going to be very much about you sharing your experiences and thoughts. So please do do that through the chat pane or through the conversation. If you do wish to contribute to the live discussion, please type in the word speak to the chat pane or use the raise hand button and uh, Susan and myself will, will bring you in. So today's session will be recorded again as we did the last time and you'll be able to access that afterwards on Education Scotland's YouTube channel. If you lose connection, uh, don't panic, just come back in through the same joining instance and Susan's mobile and my mobile number are on there if you've got any problems. So enjoy today's session. It's as um, relaxed and as conversational as uh, we can possibly make it online and um, it is different to, to being uh, together in a room. So anyway, without further ado, I'll hand back to uh, Re Rebecca and we're really looking forward to today's session. The first session we looked at um, working memory and it's in the uh, role it plays in learning, and that was um, about the you know the ability to to focus attention and filter out relevant information, etc. And then the f and and looked at, at what that might look like in the classroom. And then the following session we looked at long term memory, so the actual encoding of information, so the stuff that you know when you teach children you, and they learn stuff, it's basically what you're saying is you want them to remember and be able to recall the information that they're given. Um, so we looked at memory processes and how they actually um, work, how memory works to kind of inform us um, with regard to how um, we might uh, use mnemonics, you know, uh, sort of memory strategies to help children learn. I've just noticed that my upload is just, is, is just stuck, which of course is typical because it uploaded very speedily when we did a trial run half an hour ago. Oh, come on. Sorry, you can just bear with me. So um, what, what we want to do today is to take that information and hopefully what's happened over the last few weeks is that you've been able to apply that in some way in the classroom or with children in a different setting or, you know, children, adolescents, maybe even adults to try and um, help them with their learning? I'll go. Um, very recently, myself and the other Mrs Hamilton who's on the chat, we've been working with a child who has difficulties with his working memory um, and long-term memory uh, with processing. So I think a lot of the things that um, we've chatted about here, it was really interesting. We had a meeting with uh, the parent today and we were able to talk quite a lot about um, some of the things that we've experienced here, some of the wee activities. It's just given us really good ideas of things to try with him as well. So it's been really helpful and really current. So thank you very much. That That's really good to hear. And I often find that it, it just it helps to have sort of words to put around things that you already observe, that you already know, and probably practices that you're already putting in place. And then if you can have sort of the, the terminology that, that is linked to the research to, uh, that sort of gives it some support. Well, um, so that's great. Thank you very much. As you will see, the slides finally decided to upload. Um, so as I said, we looked at working memory. So this is the ability to inhibit information that is not relevant to the activity at hand, um, to switch attention um, between um, between items, but also to, so that's external, but also internally switching to different rules, for example, from subtraction to addition or, so, or multiplication to, to um, division or something like that. Um, and then there's, there's the pro just the, the simultaneous processing and storage of information. As I said, 
in the previous session, you know, like now you're you're processing what I'm saying, but you're also storing that information so you don't lose track of what I'm saying. And then we looked at long term memory and I won't go through how long term memories are formed again, though we did look at that to explain why um, information that is processed at a very deep level. So information that has um, some form of relevance or semantic meaning um, is more easily consolidated than information that isn't, that is more uh, um, abstract or arbitrary. Uh, and we talked about how repetition um, reinforces memory traces and makes them then, when they're stronger, they're easier to recall. We talked about the very important role of context in memory and how when we form memories, we, we attach it to existing information. And so therefore you can actually manipulate this and use context to make um, new memories more robust. Um, and a, a way of doing that is with something called elaboration, where you and we'll talk about that in a bit in a moment. So you you elaborate on the on the information that you're trying to encode, so that you actually create more connections and more roots into that memory. Um, and we also looked at recall. Um, so this is is like repetition, but it's it's more effortful in that you actively try and recall information without referring back to the original source of that information. And that is the most difficult, but obviously the most effective as well. And, it, and it's because it's difficult, it's the most difficult to get children to do it because it's very effortful, but it's very, very effective. Um, so the, then I ended the previous session with some tips. Um, so for working memory, as, as we just heard, like don't overload it unnecessarily. So don't add information that isn't relevant that could actually overload this very limited resource and make it difficult to the ch for the child to focus on the important information. Um, we talked about the use of short, repeated chunks of information because information that is de delivered instead of instead of um, you know one long stream of information. I'm sure you're all familiar with when you're reading something, and sometimes the sentence is really, really long. And you find it very difficult to digest that information and because you're overloading working memory you're trying to remember the beginning of the sentence and then the next bit and the next bit and the next bit while still processing the the remainder of the sentence so breaking that a sentence is one example but it works for information in general that you repeat it and um, break it down into short chunks and it's easier for for um, the learner to to um absorb and to process um, unnecessary background noise is detrimental, of course, because it, it means that the child has to focus even more effort, more cognitive resources in paying attention because they need to filter out that irrelevant noise. Uh, same with visual stimuli, that is attention grabbing. That can be very distracting and overload working memory. Um, and, and then just, you know, not not forcing unnecessary task switching. And this is a tricky one. Um, but if if you're it's going to contradict something that I say later about the use of, of um, interleaving um, for uh, when when um, learning new information, but um, unnecessary switching between tasks can can overload working memory because it's effortful for the learner to actually stop thinking in one way and then start thinking in another way. Um, right, so um, in terms of long-term memory, I, I talked about the use of the existing knowledge. So if you can hook that new information onto something that it's, it's, it, the child already knows well, then that can help retain that, um, that information. And then also the use of survival scenarios. And this is kind of goes back to evolution. You know, we, we need information in order to survive. Um, it's easier to remember. And this works even when it's kind of, you know, a fictional um, survival um, scenarios that help um, a, a learner navigate through some new information. That information is more easily ab absorbed. Um, you may remember the story uh, in order to remember a list of animals. I, I read a story about walking through a house and seeing all these animals in different contexts. Um, if you can adapt that to be like a survival, obviously not too traumatic, but a survival scenario, and it makes it even easier for the child to remember. Um, encouraging uh, explanation and reframing, so getting children to explain things to each other can help them um, consolidate the new information. Use of mnemonics and rhymes, you know, and we, we all used these in the past, to, to, and I will talk about them um, shortly. Um, to, that helps very much with consolidating new information. 
And when it comes to retrieval and recall, I, I talked about how recall is very effortful and, and children tend to not like it because it's so effortful or some some children do. Um, but you can do low stakes testing. You know, it doesn't have to be an exam that actually their grades are depend on. It can it can just be a short test, which it doesn't matter whether they pass or fail it. it the, what matters is that they make an effort to recall the information and then they can look up the answers. But it, it, it just helps with their learning. So. That's sort of a, a snapshot of what we covered in the previous two sessions. So in this session, we were going to discuss um, any practices that you might have try, tried over the last couple of weeks um, and, th and then just talk about how they may or may not have worked. Um, I asked this at the beginning of the session, and I know people are reluctant to be the first. Um, so thank you to, to the person who did. Um, has anybody got anything else they want to share that they've put into practice over the last couple of weeks. Anyone at all? Because I kind of assume this might happen and I completely understand. Um, so I prepared some stuff just in case um, people were, maybe that you're reluctant to share, maybe that you've been so busy like everybody that you haven't been able to as both um, absolutely fine. Oh, I see uh, Mr. Harrison. Did you have something? Yeah, no, it's just we've been on holiday for the last couple of weeks and then before that, so I haven't really had any time to, to do anything since the last session, so apologies for that. <laughs> absolutely fine. I completely understand. It's been very difficult. I just, so what I wanted to, you might remember in the last session, what I did was I told you about the learningscientist.org, and I don't know whether any of you have had a chance to have a look at it, but this is a fantastic resource that a group of academics in um, the United States put together several years ago. Um, one of them um, is Jana Weinstein, who has now left um, academia. She's moved on to, to public health, um, but she's actually came from UCL. And I believe that she is um, still a, a visiting fellow at uh, UCL Institute of Education, where I work. Um, but her and her colleagues... Um, oh, yes, and you have the book. I have the book, too. It's, it really is a fantastic resource. It's well researched, it's really knowledgeable, informative, and it's so accessible. They explain things really, really well. So rather than reinvent the wheel or basically copy what they've done, I would, thought I would, giving them full credit because it's all freely available on the, on the um, internet, go through some of these so that we can discuss some, some examples. So, so what they talk about these six um, strategies for learning, um, and I didn't cover them all in the last two weeks, but um, I sort of covered that. They, 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 um, they overlap in terms of the memory process that the processes that they're tapping. Um, so I kind of covered those and I generalized with some of them, but, but I thought we could go through a few of them now. So there's concrete examples, which I'll talk about first, and then elaboration and retrieval practice that we did talk about, um, and dual coding, which I also talked about last week. Then we have spaced practice and interleaving. The, if any of you are teachers, I, I would say that you probably know about those already anyway, but I can cover them toward the end um, for anybody who's interested. So let's look at um, concrete examples. So this, this, uh, the, what what children are told to do, or students of any kind are told to do when they're learning um, new information, is collect examples that maybe the educator has used um, in the lesson, and then try and find other materials that you can use for uh, different examples. Now, when I say materials, it doesn't have to be you know, sort of bits and bobs from the, the dress up box or something like that. I'm talking about anything, you know, examples that you can conjure up in your head as well. Now, for every single one of these, Yana and her colleague record a short video, which you can watch on YouTube. They're only about two, maybe three minutes each for each one. And they briefly explain what it is and briefly give an example. So they're really worth watching. But I thought I would um, use these here. And by the way, as I go through this, because we, we did want this to be an interactive session, please do jump in and, and make any comments, either by putting your camera on or raising your hand or putting it in the chat, any of those. 
Um, so, OK, so concrete examples. So so um, you've had a lesson. The teacher's given some examples in order to uh, uh, to explain the new concept. And you go away and try and find some other examples as well, because every time you do this, what you're doing is you're thinking about the original idea, the original concept. So you're making that link every time you think up a new example. Um, and then, if, and this get, to, speaks to elaboration as well, you share those examples with friends and you explain to them, explain the examples to the friend and they do the same to you. Um, so, you know, fellow student, friend, whatever. And this again uh, reactivates that original knowledge. Um, and it puts it in like a different uh, context. So again, you remember what I was talking about earlier and last session about the importance of context in learning and how that can create more roots into the memory when you're trying to recall it. Um, so these examples, because of that, have to be very relevant. And you may remember at the last session I talked about um, sometimes such learning strategies can be misapplied. And I think I used the example if you wanted to learn about I saw this example on Twitter where some children were, the teacher wanted them to learn, I think it was somebody recalling something from school, the teacher wanted them to learn about something in history. I'm going to say King Henry VIII, just because I can't think of anything else. And what they did was they had a, an art lesson where they all made puppets of the different characters, you know, different wives in King Henry VIII which doesn't really work because the children will remember very well the process of making the puppets, but not actually much about the historical content because it wasn't important in what they were doing. It wasn't something that they had to constantly recall to mind um, what actually happened in that part of history. Um, so anyway, so I thought as a concrete example, I would use a concrete example. OK, so. I, would, I thought I'd use an adult one and a concept that when I was first studying statistics, I found very difficult um, to understand. So um, when you're doing experimental research, which I do, you tend to look at something that is an independent variable that has, so this is the thing that has an, a cause or actually affects another variable. And that is the dependent variable. So making it a very, very easy and relevant example is the amount of time you study influences the exam grade you'll get. And the more study time, the higher the exam grade. That's a very good example of an independent variable and a dependent variable. But what you often, often happen, what, what you, you some can, can see is that um, there's another variable that plays a role in that relationship and sometimes that variable is a mediator and sometimes that variable is a moderator and this was a concept that I found it very difficult to get my head around so what I did was I used concrete examples to explain it to myself so I could then more easily understand this fairly abstract concept so if you look at it in this way and this is basically what I've just said but if I were to say a mediator mediates the relationship between the independent and dependent variable, explaining the reason for such a relationship. A moderator is a way to check whether a third variable influences the strength or direction of the relationship between an independent and dependent variable. Now, that's fairly um, abstract description of it. It's, there's nothing there you can really get hold of because you're trying to understand that information and all you're getting is the information. There's nothing to get your hooks into. There's nothing that you can, you know, apply um, your existing knowledge to. But then if I used examples and said something like, OK, let's look at an example of a mediator. Now, here's, here's a mediator. People with higher incomes tend to live longer but this effect is explained by a mediating influence of having access to better health care. So the mediator explains why people with higher incomes live longer. So it's another example with children would be um, children. Uh, actually, no, I'll come back to that. So that's the mediator. It explains why. So somebody um, having more money, the actual money in their bank account doesn't have a physiological effect on their body. The mediator is that because they have this more money, they have better access to health care. Um, a moderator might be an example like this. A 
academic confidence is one's ability to do well in school. It moderates the relationship between task importance and the amount of test anxiety a student feels. So this is not abstract. So academic con confidence is actually a thing that can have a direct effect. So the moderator is the what and the mediator is the, is the how. Now, you may not still if you, you, you may know this, you might think, I understand stats, what you're talking about. Um, but if, you, if this was new to you, what you could do now is go away, think as many examples as you possibly could that would explain a mediator compared to a moderator, which would help you consolidate that knowledge and then bring it more easily to mind. OK, later on. Was that, um, so if you, another example. Um, so if you looked at, I did have another example written down no i don't want i don't want to get onto that because then i might get off track and <laughs> confuse myself as well as you but that's a, an example of how you, you're taught something you're given an example and now in order to to consolidate that learning you could go away and think of some some other examples yourself so let's look at another one dual coding which is something that i looked at in the last session so dual coding, oops. Um, so this is purely about putting different modes of information presentation together to support each other so that it's more easy. To, again, it creates more pathways into that knowledge, into those memories so that you can more easily recall them. So um, you can use visuals you can look at visuals and you can explain them in your own words as to what they mean, or you could look at you know, some text and then draw something that would actually support your understanding of the text. Okay, so it's this, it's exactly what it is. It's dual coding, which gives you more, one, more than one pathway into that memory. So when you think about it, you can have visual representations and you can have representations in, representations in, in terms of uh, words, like verbal information as well. Um, so uh, these are just some some examples that are used on the on the learning scientist website. But you try and come up with different ways to represent the information. So you could do uh, infographic or a cartoon strip or something like that. Um, and what I thought I would do is use an example here as well. Um, so th this is just again information from the website. But you try and come up with different ways to represent the same information. Um, so in history, it works well because you can have timelines and you can draw pictures at the top of the timelines. Um, and I am going to, at some point, get to the information I want. Um, so that this, I mean, a diagram, anybody who teaches biology knows that diagrams really, really help. Instead of just explaining something verbally, if you put it in a diagram, it's easier for that information to be recalled. Um, so again, this is just from the website. So then what you do is you take that. So if you've started with words and you've drawn um, a diagram to help you exp um, understand those words, then you try and draw that diagram from memory. Or you can do it the other way around. You've seen a, a, a picture of something and then you want to um, you put some words around it to describe it. And then you try and recall those words from memory. So I'm going to use an example um a, a sort of a an example just from teaching psychology and then I'll, I'll look at some examples for for much younger children which you may already use <clears throat> so if i was to talk about synaptic con um, transmission so this is the uh, the way that neurons in the brain communicate with each other it's called synaptic transmission and if i were to say synaptic transmission is the process by which one neuron communicates with another Information is passed down the axon of the neuron as an electrical impulse known as action potential. When the electrical, um, electrical impulse action potential reaches the synaptic um, vesicles, they release their contents of neurotransmitters. So if I were to say that to you, you'd be like, Whoa. and then you could read it in a book and you could read it over and over again. And you can you could probably learn that and eventually you could learn it so that you could reel it off and eventually get to understand it. But if you were to do something like this, 
Okay, so we've got this, you know, this um, neuron, and that I didn't cover dendrites in that spiel, or spiel but you would um, talk about dendrites. And then here, I don't know whether you can see your my mouse, but at the top, you've got arrows going information flows. And then you've got the axon with not myelin sheaths over the axon, which I didn't cover. And then the the terminate, uh, terminal buttons and then the, the gap between two different synaptics being the synaptic cleft or gap. This visual helps you understand it. So when you know we, we go away from this screen and you're not seeing this, you you could recall the verbal information I gave you, but you can also recall the um, visual information that you might have drawn yourself. <coughs> and it works in reverse, as I've said. But we use this all the time when teaching very young children. Um, and this is the same thing, it's dual coding. So there and there, I don't know whether you use this one, but here you can see the there when you're talking about a person has a person in it replacing the eye. And this is something that, that young children can visually recall so that they um, go, which one's there? Oh, yeah, the one with the person in it. Got it. So it's an, it's a different way to recall that information rather than just there when you're talking about a person is T-H-E-I-R. Um, when you look at another one, we can look at this the other way around. So you, you might see the points of a compass, um, but then you can think, well, <coughs> I actually want to put some words to that so that I can more easily recall it instead of just having to recall the visual image of northeast southwest. So this is one that was alive and well when I was a child. I don't know about anybody else. Um, never reached shredded wheat, north east, north east southwest. And it helps you go clockwise round and remember which way is north east southwest. <coughs> and yet yeah, somebody is saying this, we still use it. I still use it for east and west. I know which way is north and south. I don't not know which way east is, but sometimes I just have to remind myself. I'm one of those people that has problems with left and right as well. So I go like this. So I know that's left. It doesn't take me a long time <laughs> to work it out, but I still have to do this. Um, oh, Naughty Elephant Squirt Water. That is cute. I wish I'd had that one. Then I could have had an additional uh, visual. Um, lovely. Um, so let's go on to the next learning strategy. So elaboration, I did talk about this in the last session. So this is where you, <coughs> you take a concept and you explain it in your own words to yourself, to the dog, to the wall, um, to, to a friend, to whatever. But what it does is it helps you to reframe this information. And again, what this does is it creates more representations of that information as memories and makes it easier to recall. So um, what you have is something <clears throat> very specific in this within this memory strategy, which is elaborative interrogation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and what you do is you ask classmates and get, or, you know, fellow students um, to ask you questions about that information so that you have to reframe it. And then you can do the same for them. So it's a, it's a really good team based learning um, activity. Um, so, so I've just said that basically that you create connections between ideas. Um, somebody was just, oh, and somebody go to speak then. Yes, sorry, I was trying to raise my hand there, but um, no, okay. I, I, I guess the danger with elaboration is that um, when they rephrase something, you have to check that they're rephrasing it correctly, and that there aren't any. Um, any misconceptions that have carried through into the elaboration? That is absolutely 100% true. And I've actually just had a, a master's student uh, finish their dissertation project, was looking at exactly that for um, retrieval practice. So mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, retrieved information, when maybe two students are... Um, yeah, what we, let's just say you're using retrieval practice and the wrong answer is recalled. Does that strengthen the connection between that that question and that answer? Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and yes, and, and this was a really, really interesting. She did a systematic review and it was really interesting and we're, we're going to see whether we can get it published because it is such an important point. And, the, and what that highlights is the importance of understanding 
the neuroscience behind it. And I'm not saying about, oh, you have to understand how neurons work and, you know, electrical um, and chemical interactions. I'm not saying that at all. It's more understanding why that works. And we know why it works because of neuroscience. So it's that it's the educational neuroscience. We, I'm, I'm a member of the Center for Educational Neuroscience. And it's that connection between what we know because of neuroscience and how that informs education. If you understand the why, then you are able to um, to be very aware of things that, that you just raised, that you can actually strengthen these connections with incorrect information if it if it's not governed properly. So I think you raise a really, really important point there. Um, the, the good thing about elaborative interrogation it, as a form of elaboration is that as a teacher, you can kind of govern the questions that are asked and the information that is available to answer them. But you do still have to be on top of it very much, yes. Because if it goes off the rails, that is a bit, um, yeah, counterproductive. Um, so, yes, so here on the next slide, make sure the way you're explaining and describing the idea is accurate. Don't overextend. Always check your class materials or ask your teacher. So these these slides are for children. Um, but yes, um, re reinforcing the point you just made. Um, so so you, yeah, with this you kind of work your way up. You answer small questions and then build a. You ask small questions, build a series of questions until you can actually um, create um, an entire dialogue or. or um, piece of text to describe an event. So I've used an example um, from their website um, about Pearl Harbor. If you were teaching some, some school children a history lesson about Pearl Harbor. So, um, oh no, sorry, sorry. First, I'm gonna talk about um, elaboration, not, not uh, elaborative interrogation. First about elaboration. So we use it a lot in spelling. So um, how to spell special. The CIA, the CIA are special agents. Um, some people may even <coughs> still use some of these or other ones that are similar. Um, so um, desert, dessert, always a good one. Um, the desert is full of sand. The dessert is full of sweet stuff. So S is sand is one S. <coughs> um, dessert is two S's. So you're elaborating on a simple rule. Um, people eat omelettes, people like eggs, how do you know young children learning to spell people and so on and so forth. And of course, we love the rhyming ones like difficulty, Mrs. D, Mrs. I, Mrs. F, F, I, Mrs. C, Mrs. U, Mrs. L, T, Y. And these are great for children, you know, to sort of get that that rhyme happening and they love repeating it. And which, of course, brings in um, re uh, repetition as well. Um, so we do use it um, a lot. In, for very young children, you can use it in older children in the form of elaborative interrogation. So, like I said, I'm using here an example um, for the attack on Pearl Harbor. So you could ask questions like, <clears throat> how did it happen? Why did it happen? What was the result of this event? And why is it important? So all the things that you would want children to understand about a very important historical event. And of course, you know, there are so many. Um, so then you would get, you know, it happened on December the 7th, 1941. The Japanese Navy attacked the state's naval base at Pearl Harbor. They used planes, bombers, torpedoes. The Japanese wanted to destroy the state's um, fleet so that it could not interfere with Japanese operations in the war. There weren't many Japanese casualties, but there are a lot of um, U.S. casualties, um, battleships and aircraft destroyed. And then you've got the numbers of Americans who were killed and injured. Um, and then the day after the attack, Roosevelt formally declared war on Japan. So this is, you know, this is something that you can repeat. And if you're doing it, if you buddy up um, students in a learning session and they don't know it, they can try to remember it. And then if they can't remember it, they go and look it up and then put that away and explain it. So it's something you can really build in. It's very, it, it's very organic, you know, the way this can grow. It's a, it's a very effective learning technique. But yes, you do have to make sure that they're providing the right information. Um, so those are the main techniques that we use, that, that I talked about um, in the last uh, last session, yeah, not so much the one before. 
um, which are all things that you can you can use when you're teaching. Um, I have covered, well, we did talk about retrieval practice uh, last um, session, and there, and there are some slides here on that, but they do pretty much repeat um, what I said before. But I just, I, I have got some slides on space practice and interleaving and explaining how and why they work, if you don't already know about them. But I just wondered whether, having got this far, whether anybody um, wanted to sort of discuss the uh, concrete examples, elaboration, dual coding, the, the examples that I've covered so far. Is there anything from your own practice that you wanted to share? Anyone at all? It's always interesting to see that, you know, quite often these things are already being done and, and sometimes educators know about why and sometimes um, not so much, but they know they're effective, which is fine. Um, somebody is typing, so I'm just going to give them the chance to type. If anybody else has anything to, to share on it, you could definitely do so. Um, anybody want to sort of put their, their mic on and share anything? Um, Dual coding, very helpful for pupils with dyslexia in, in particular. That's an interesting one. So how, how do you use it for children with dyslexia? Are you able to, to put your mic on and explain? Would that be that? Typing. This could be the... Um, the spelling side of it. Um, so backing up new words, concepts with lots of graphs, pics, etc. So, uh, so as a basic example, like the the there with an I and um, the the special. Well, yeah, that is kind of special is more elaboration, but um, yeah, you can use it to create. Like you know, the, a good example is bed isn't it? So you, you make the word bed into a bed to, um, to help with that. With all children have problem with letter reversal at some stage. Most children do. Um, so it's a, it's a good one to use. <coughs> um, so shall I, shall I go in, on to talk about, I don't, I don't really want to cover retrieval practice again because I've really talked about this throughout, you know, where you actually sort of test each other students test each other on the information that's available. But I could talk about uh, the, the information that's been taught. I could talk about space practice and interleaving briefly if you if you wanted me to. Do you think that would be a good thing? We've got a couple of people. Yes, okay, I'll take one yes as an excuse to carry on talking. Um, so, space practice. So, this is um, the idea, as you, I mean, you all know, right, that cramming is not effective. You can cram for an exam, um, and it, you might actually remember it for that exam, but that information is very quickly going to be forgotten. It's not going to be consolidated. But if you break your learning up into, so you have a lesson, you have a break, and then you review the information, and then, um, you know, a few days later, you review it again, or maybe a week later, or if we're talking about exams, um, information through an entire term for an exam, you might look at something that you learned a month ago, and then a week ago, and then a day ago. And this is much more effective than learning all that information in one big chunk. Um, so, so creating a, a, a study plan like this is effective because when we learn stuff it starts to fade you know so if you didn't revisit any of the information that i'm giving you now that information will start to fade but the more often you revisit it <coughs> the more likely you are to remember it in the future and when you space practice because information doesn't decay immediately i mean it does something like remembering a phone number long enough to dial it that probably would but information that's more relevant it doesn't immediately disappear as soon as this presentation um, stops. It starts to fade. And so that's why if you actually leave the, the 
in a little while to start to fade and then you reactivate that information as it's starting to fade you strengthen it even more so if when it's still active and you recall it it's not effortful you're not reactivating that neural network that is storing that information um but when that is start to fade and you reactivate then you are strengthening it because you're re you're you're reactivating that neural network um and also you're creating context because you recall it in different situations which again as i covered last session um also strengthens memory traces <coughs> excuse me um so like i said cre cre it's so you create small spaces um throughout the day to 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 revisit or study certain information. What this has the added benefit of is that you will sleep in between activating that information, maybe one night's sleep, seven nights sleep, whatever. Um, and consolidation, sleep is incredibly important for systems consolidation. So when you first learn stuff and you might repeat it or you know create concrete examples or elaborate or something like that, you can create systems. So that that um, what happens as a result of that is systems cons uh, synaptic consolidation. So you're strengthening that neural network. What happens over a period of time, and in that period of time, sleep is so important. You get systems consolidation. So this is where there is multiple networks, multiple connections for new information. So this again speaks to context and attaching to existing knowledge, etc. So sleeping in between, um, you know, studying something, having a sleep for a while, studying um, is very beneficial for, for both those reasons. Then we have the last practice, which is interleaving, which may sound quite similar because what you do, oh, Mr. Harrison has his hand raised. I'm sorry if it's been, been a while. I didn't notice. Did you have something? Yeah, I, I did. Sorry. Um, so the idea that you're increasing the length of time between each time you go back to that bit of information is that because after each time you've visited it the length of time it fades takes longer um i i'm not sure whether the length of time it, it fades takes longer but the amount of that information that does fade is less the more times you reactivate it um so yeah, like you were saying is one day one week then one month um is, is that important that there is increasing length of time between spaced oh i, I see what you mean no i'm sort of giving that as as an example but if you were learning something new yeah something brand new um that, that you needed to remember for an exam or something then revisiting it the next day would be a good idea but then not every single day then yeah leave it a week so it starts to fade a little bit because then when you re revisit it again you're going to make that that memory representation more robust and then yeah leave it for longer periods of time so it's not um what does does it take it longer to fade <sighs> i don't i'm not so i it, that's a difficult one. I, th I think it's more that the um, the the detail of that memory trace, um, l more detail is likely to be forgotten early on and then less and less over time if you're repeating it. Right. You know what I mean? right. Yeah. Okay. So it becomes, every time you recall it, it becomes more robust. So you've got to give it a bit more time to start to fade. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. That's good. Good question. Um, so then on to interleaving, which sounds kind of like the same thing. But with interleaving, it's like space practice. But in those gaps, what you do is you, you switch up what you are actually trying to revise, you know, trying to learn, trying to remember, consolidate, whatever, um, and make it as different as possible. And what this does is something called differentiation. And the more distinct um, uh, information in memory is, 
then the more likely you are to remember it. So if you've got, if you revise topic A, which was something in history, and then you revise topic B, which was something maybe in, in physics, and then topic C, maybe something in geography, or you could even go back to topic A, what you're doing is either side of what you're studying, you're um, creating memories of other information and making the individual memories more distinct. So this helps one with consolidate making that information more robust in memory, but more easy when I say robust, what I always mean is more easily recalled when you need it. But you're also um, reducing the likelihood of confusion. So if you were were learning something about history and you were learning, um, uh, I'm trying to think of something, um, uh, maybe the two world wars, okay? then that information, because they're both world wars, you might be looking at it in terms of the role Britain paid, played in those world wars, and you can start to get confused and conflate. Children can start to conflate what happened and who was involved and why something happened. If you can make those those um, studies, those that information more distinct in memory by interspersing or interleaving it with revising other information, so that you know, looking at World War One and then looking at physics, looking at World War Two and then looking at, at something in French or something like that. I mean, I'm I'm making these subjects up. I'm not a teacher, so it's not as easy for me to think of examples. Um, and and uh, so what was that? yes, and of course, this has the added benefit of the space practice because topic A, you're going to skip that for a couple of study sessions because you're looking at topic B and topic C. So that is, I'm oh, sorry. So if you've got three study sessions, maybe daily or weekly or whatever, it, it depends very much on what you're trying to learn for what purpose. Um, you have space practice, but what during those, but what you're actually doing is you're having a space practice for this event, so one, two, three, and space practice for this event, one, two, three. But you're actually also making where every time you revise those memories more distinct from each other. Therefore, so it's got like a dual, um, like a double whammy of consolidation, if you will. So interleaving is is very, very effective, especially if you combine it with elaboration. Um, so, yes, as with most very, very effective study techniques, it will feel a lot harder than studying the same thing. So if you go, this afternoon I'm doing history, that sounds nice and cosy and you sit down with your mug of tea and you, this is what I'm going to learn. It's a lot more effortful to do study one thing for an hour and then put that away and then switch your attention to something else. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Don't confuse this with switching in the classroom when it comes to working memory. This is something else. Um, it, it, it is much harder and and tiring but it is very very effective because what you're doing is you're you're forcing yourself or, or the neural connections in your brain to reactivate every time you study something different which makes them more distinct and more robust um so that in a nutshell is interleaving which takes me to my last slide which is thank you for listening to me again talk <laughs> an hour I hope it was okay um, and uh, has anybody got any questions um, did you want me to stop sharing my screen I will stop presenting so that Susan or Beverly can, can come back and and talk. Um, what about scaffolding? Ah, oh, Vygotsky, good old Vygotsky, we love him. Um, yeah, scaffolding is like, as it sounds, it's very much like the framework within which you can apply these because, of course, you know, you see you're scaffolding a, <coughs> a child's learning by giving them this 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 um, this framework in which they can move up the stages of, of complexity and the um, 
of the information that they can learn. But in order to help them, you can give them elaboration techniques and they can use space practice and interleaving. Um, you can give them dual coding, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like scaffolding is exactly the scaffold, that, the scaffolding, and the, uh, everything else is the, the uh, materials you use to actually build the house, if you like. But I, I love Vygotsky, so thank you for raising scaffolding. Um, has anybody else got any more questions? Do feel free to put your cameras on so I'm not looking at, at circles with initials and um, Sorry, somebody is leaving. That's uh, absolutely fine. Um, uh, yeah, I hope you find it useful. <coughs> Has anybody else got any questions? I was just going to ask, I know we've kind of been um, talking about this in terms of children. Um, I was thinking about this for, for adults. Um, does the same apply? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yes, 100%. Um, it, it, it's the way that we form new memories does not change from when we're, we're children to adults. Um, what we understand about memory ourselves, so children very under, understand very little about their own capacity to remember things. Um, and as you grow older, you, you get more of an idea of how likely you are to remember stuff. Um, and then, of course, there's the speed with which we can process information becomes quicker as we get older. So therefore, we can, um, we can handle more input and understand it more quickly. Um, but the, the basic mechanisms of how memory is formed do, don't change. So the use of these um, the use of these techniques uh, hold till you know the, the entire life lifespan. And um, and as we've seen from myself and other people here, we still use stuff that we learned at school. I still use never eat shredded wheat, you know, <laughs> um, and uh, and this for left and right. Um, and somebody else, the Naughty Elephant Spurts Water, which I love. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Um, so you can, whether you're teaching uh, primary school children or um, secondary school or adolescents or university students or you yourself are studying, then, it, yeah, it holds true. Um, ooh, Mr. Harrison disappeared and now he's back. Um, and it also, um, you know, especially when you're talking about adolescents and adults with um, special um, educational needs, they're, they're very useful um, to support learning to scaffold, as, as was raised. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I thought it was uh, fascinating. I really enjoyed listening about the, the spaced learning because it's um, something that I, I've always kind of, the approach I've taken, but not maybe known why I've done that um, and so it, it for me it made um, sort of all, all sense um, as the way you put it so so that was brilliant but I, I don't want to hog anybody's time um, if there's any other questions to come in. Riz are you still on the line? I'm just wondering if you had any questions. Um, somebody is, is typing. Um, so, yes, I mean, it's, it's like most things. The, the best way to, um, the more effortful <laughs> the learning strategy, the more effective it's going to be. But, it, it, but being effortful doesn't mean that has to be stressful. And I think that there is this thing, not in the classrooms now, I think teachers are excellent, but back, you know, in my day when we were being taught stuff, you know, there was so much stress around it because you had to get it right. Um, but it's um, but if you can make it low stakes, you know, where it doesn't it doesn't matter if you get it wrong, you can look it up afterwards. Just try and remember it. That's the important thing, and that again brings me back to this thing of understanding that gap between neuroscience and education. And and it's not all about waggling test tubes and looking at genes. It's about understanding why something works so you can apply it correctly. It's a good thing. We have a hand up. Yep. The person with the hand up. Would you like? Yes. Um, the, the last time you were talking about interleaving, and um, apologies, I, I, I lost power and missed the last bit of your talk on that. Um, but the last time you talked about interleaving, you said the research wasn't as sound on the 
the effect, the effectiveness of interleaving. But when you talked about it just now, it sounded as though you were pretty convinced that this is, this is <laughs> a valuable tool. Um, I probably, yeah, I might might have misspoken. I think in terms of its effectiveness as as a a learning strategy on its own is not necessarily effective. But if you're you when you're doing when you're actually doing that study, interleaving it, if you apply elaboration, dual coding, etc., right. then you get this this distinction of the memory traces. It's when it's it's peddled on its own as a very, you know, oh, just okay. learn history and yeah. geography and math, and that's really effective. In in isolation, it's not so much. But um, when you actually apply the, the other, yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. I should have made that clearer. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's been brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate that. I'm glad that you found it useful. <laughs>